Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Center for Global Development. My name is Javier Guzman. I'm the Director of Global Health Policy. And it is a pleasure for me to host this event about the future of global health financing. Over the past two decades, we've witnessed the golden era of global health. New global health initiatives, including Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, the Global Fund, the Global Financing Facility, have made remarkable progress against specific diseases such as HIV AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis. Of course, development assistance for health has also increased substantially, both before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2021, it's estimated that $67 billion were invested as part of this development assistance for health. And a significant proportion of that money is being channeled through these global health initiatives, including the Global Fund and Gavi. In 2019, these two organizations accounted for 14% of the de development assistance for health. Those are great news. However, the global health architecture has become increasingly complex and the proliferation of these initiatives has led to the verticalization of aid, fragmentation and circumvention of government systems. Now, I think everyone recognizes um, the need to give countries more ownership, more control over their own health agendas. And questions have been raised as to whether the current global health architecture, the current global health financing system supports universal health coverage and sustainable financing for health. We do know that we need strong, resilient systems to address current and future challenges such as demography, climate change, pandemics. And we know that the current architecture wasn't built to support and to build um, health systems. So this is important at this juncture because um, development assistance for health is plateauing and low, lower income countries are actually going through a very difficult fiscal crisis. So in response to these challenges, the future of global health initiatives a process chaired by representatives from the Kenya and the Norwegian governments um, took place in the past 14 years. And, and yesterday, they launched the Lusaka Agenda as part of the Universal Health Coverage Day. That agenda defines key shifts needed for the long-term evolution of global health initiatives, but also it outlines a path towards a long-term vision of domestically financed health systems and universal health coverage. So it is my pleasure to welcome our panelists and welcome you all for this conversation. First, we're gonna have a short presentation from one of the co-chairs of the Future of Global Health Initiatives. She is Mercy Mwagangi. Um, as I said, she was the chair of the Future of Global Health Initiatives and she's the director of Health Systems Strengthening strengthening at AMREF Health Africa. So Mercy, welcome to CGD. It's a pleasure to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Javier, um, for the warm welcome. And um, thank you to the CGD team for allowing us to meet today and share your platform um, together with um, your networks. And thank you to my fellow panelists um, for making time to be here today as we discuss um, what the future of the global health financing architecture should look like. Um, as introduced by Javier, um, I will be taking you through um, a 14 month process that um, concludes uh, or concluded uh, yesterday on UHC Day. And it's essentially what has been known as the Future of Global Health Initiatives. And it's a process that we began um, together with uh, the Norwegian government. Um, this took place um, about 14 months ago, where we came together with the aim of um, looking at one, um, what does the current ecosystem look like when it comes to um, the global health financing architecture? Um, so recognizing- do, do you want to do slideshow so we can- yeah, thank Sure. You. Thank you. So recognizing the benefits that have taken place um, over the years and Javier, you've correctly highlighted, we had the golden era and a lot of outcomes, good health outcomes were made from the Global Fan, Gavi, GFF and all the other many um, GHIs that exist in that ecosystem. But then the question and particularly post um, the COVID-19 pandemic has been, how do we 
ensure that as we move forward, um, we are really ensuring that we are maximizing health impacts and that we have um, country-led um, trajectories towards UHC. And so this process uh, commenced about 14 months ago with myself and Yon Anan as co-chairs of the process. And we had membership of various countries as highlighted in the screen. And we also had observership, um, particularly from the World Health Organization, UNICEF and the World Bank. And the whole idea was, and I really want to reiterate this, is that um, GHIs have delivered an impressive, impressive amount of impact in, in particularly the strategic programs. And that this process was not going to come in to change any mandates, but to rather ask in totality, how do we support countries' trajectories towards UHC? And what does the future look like? And most importantly, how do we build on existing work? And one key element as we took uh, this process forward 14 months ago was to ask ourselves, how do we build on what is existing and what has been there? And on the screen, you can see different initiatives that have taken place. I'm sure most of you um, in the audience have engaged or, or have participated in this or have written about this. Um, we all remember the IHP Plus process. Um, we're all familiar with the good work that the UHC 2030 team does. Um, we've had different um, engagements, particularly the GFF alignment group, all towards how do we come and coordinate better and, and really support countries towards their journeys uh, on UHC. Under the Africa Union, you've all heard of the high-level meeting on health financing chaired by His Excellency Kagame. Again, a process that, that we are building onto and, you know, following through with the work that has been done there. And then, of course, there's been various initiatives by different countries when it comes to alignment. And, of course, under the leadership of WHO and, and, and various other um, bilateral, unilateral, multilateral agencies, we have the Global Action Plan. And so how we undertook this process, and and, and really I, I, I'd like to remind you all to reflect on how we governed ourselves and how we set ourselves up. We had the membership um, of various countries, and at the time, um, the membership of those countries were also sitting in the various GHI boards. And so what we undertook was a three-phase um, process, and uh, we're currently actually about to get into the third phase. And so I'll be talking heavily on the first phase and the second phase. Um, the first phase involved a lot of listening, a lot of engaging, and it was essentially our evidence generation phase. And I would like to thank the Welcome Trust um, for supporting this process where we had an independent study that was commissioned. And this process was driven by what was known as a research and learning task team that consisted of most of the membership that you've seen there in the steering group, but also this was opened up to really bring together uh, various academic agencies and bodies who had interest in this um, research area. And the key outcome out of that was an independent research report that had findings and recommendations. And that was the first phase. We then moved to the second phase, which is essentially taking those recommendations and, and you know, having sort of what we'd call the political commitment process um, initiated. And so together with um, input and feedback from various other country case studies, we were able to have this work supported by what is known as our, our extended committee task team. And I'd really like to, I don't know if they're on the call, but I'd like to really thank the CDO team. I'd like to thank um, our, our Gerald from Malawi, who really took the leadership and helm in really transforming what was um, an independent research um, report into then what does it mean when it comes to the various stakeholders and how do we build consensus around this phase. And this culminated um, in two weeks ago in what we call the Lusaka agenda, whereby we had conclusions of the FGHI process. And we were able to share these on the sidelines of the Africa CDC CFIA meeting. As we look forward in terms of what will be going on next, um, we would like to then um, have what would be known as an implementation phase. And this phase is led by GHI boards um, together with their secretariat. And it's essentially looking at the outputs of the Lusaka agenda and asking ourselves, what do we need to do to actually implement um, the elements that came through? Now, in terms of the Lusaka agenda, um, you know, one of the key things is that um, for me, it captured five key shifts. And, and these are the key, what we call uh, long-term um, evolution shifts that need to take place in the global financing architecture. And it essentially provides um, a foundation for coordinated action to support these shifts with a longer term vision of really moving and working with different countries towards domestically financed health systems for UHC. And that is very key. Now, 
In terms of um, the Lusaka agenda, and I would say the underpinning vision of it is that we looked at the vision and, and really talked about and, and I'd say um, envisioned a future where you have a global health system that has all actors, including GHIs, who contribute towards the achievement of UHC. And if we look at the gray box there, we can see the different um, roles and, res and responsibilities and contributions to this vision. We have the implementing countries who need to take increasing responsibility for priority setting and for putting in place cost-effective interventions that lead to good health outcomes. We have donors who then need to um, look at how they can shift accountability for delivery to countries and how we can ensure that all the investments are geared towards PHC-oriented UHC results. And then we have GHIs who have been key, who've done a fantastic uh, job over the years and really would be catalytic in ensuring that the future, you know, leans towards domestic resource mobilization and catalyzing and really leveraging on all those gains that have been made over the years. So what are the five key shifts? Um, you know, and this is the core of the Lusaka agenda. So the first one is, of course, to make a stronger contribution towards PHC. The second one is to ensure that um, a catalytic role is played um, by the GHIs towards sustainable domestic financed um, and public health functions by countries. The third element was to look at joint approaches. What does it mean for us to have cohesion and particularly towards equity in health outcomes? And then, of course, the fifth one touches on products, research and development and, and other market shaping elements. And it's important to for me to highlight this and to stress this. This is building up on work um, that is already underway. And I'm sure in the plenary, we'll be able to share with you all the different initiatives that are underway. I know the GHIs have already set forth on key uh, pillars which build on to these five strategic shifts. And I'm aware that different convenings under the AU at WHO are all working towards this five key shift areas. When we peel this, um, the first layer from what it means from the Lusaka agenda, we were able to identify nine key elements which we believe should be near-term priorities over the next one to three years. The first one, of course, touches on power imbalances when it comes to governance mechanisms, and it will be the responsibility of the GHI boards to really look and, and, and reflect and, and come up with roadmaps as to how we can um, start um, having a balance when it comes to power in governance. Um, the second one touches on common matrices um, for he health system strengthening, for in-country alignment alignment for equity when it comes to health outcomes. And again, there we'll be sharing with you some of the initiatives that are underway when it comes to um, having common matrices in place. I think the third element is then looking at what the um, you know, really having an appreciation of the impact of health systems. Of course, talking about um, aligning and using government systems. When we talk about moving towards domestic resources, we cannot um, shy away or close our eyes to what it means to use government systems. We need to look at how we can simplify grant application and disbursement processes. We need to look at transparency uh, over external financial flows. We need to look at how we can accelerate and coordinate better for sustainability. We need to, um, how do I say, implement and move towards this joint vision of R&D, marketing and market shaping. And then, of course, we all need to have as as, as stakeholders and participants um, in the global sphere, we do need that joint vision of what future um, the future of development assistance for health will look like. Now, in terms of... Um, this progress and 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 the actions particularly by ghis it's important to emphasize and, and i'm happy that we have uh, jose here with us um that each ghi will be individually responsible of developing a long-term roadmap, roadmap that can operationalize these shifts and what is key is that even as they do come in as individual GHIs to develop these roadmaps, they still need to ensure that this is underpinned by collective and joint action across the ghis now, in terms of um, the next steps um, for engagement and, and how, you know, we, we, we've envisioned um, operationalization of these shifts, um, the teens and the friends and supporters who worked on the FGHI process will continue to work with the GHI uh, governance structures to look at near-term action. Um, and one of the key, I'd say, center um, 
stakeholders in this work are the different secretariats. Um, that's the Gavi and Global Fund Secretariat. And I'm sure um, the chair here will be able to share with us what is going on when it comes to uh, developing a joint work plan around core agreed areas between the two GHIs. Um, there have been discussions as to how we can set up a joint Gavi Global Fund Board Oversight Mechanism. And again, stressing that this is going to be led by the GHIs. We need to then look at cross-board collaboration and what that would look like, of course, including GFF and other stakeholders, and ensuring that this is set up towards the end of next year, 2024. We then need to set in motion what country implementation of these shifts would look like. So these are global shifts. How do they present and how do they mirror at country level? And that's a process that we will be undertaking uh, through 2024. And I'd like to thank Patrick, who is one of our panelists, because he'll be leading us in that process. And then, of course, working with um, key stakeholders when it comes to coordinated R&D and market shaping um, approaches, um, highlighting the key role that CEPI, UNITED, and FIND uh, play in this space. Um, as we move towards, um, you know, this next phase that I've just shared with you, um, one of the key things is that we do have a transition arrangement in place. We were able to um, come to the point of concluding the FGHI process uh, with the Lusaka agenda. And so right now what we're doing is setting up an informal interim four month uh, process. This will be led by Patrick uh, Kumar Bojai, who's here with us and Desta. And um, essentially it is to you know, look at those nine points that I highlighted earlier and to come up with what does implementation look like? Again, heavily led by the GHIs. And so that is the FGHI process. And I really would like to extend um, my thanks to all people who have contributed to this process. We've had many stakeholders beyond the countries who have sat in the steering groups. We've had very good contributions from WHO, from Bruce, Susan Sparks. We've had good contributions from the World Bank team, good contributions from the GFF team, good contributions from the UNICEF team, but also um, from participants who are on this call. So thank you all. And I think I'll hand over back to you, um, Javier. Mercy, thank you very much and congratulations on this important initiative. Um, now we're going to move to our conversation with a stellar group of panelists. So let me introduce them first. So first we have uh, Jose Manuel Barroso. Uh, he is the chair of the board, uh, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. We also have uh, Patrick Kuma Abuaji. He is the director general Ghana Health Service at the Ministry of Health in Ghana. We also have Jorg Sankia, State Secretary for International Development from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Norway. And last but not least, we've got Nida Yusuf, Senior Health Financing Advisor at Save the Children. Um, the first question for you all um, is, you heard Mercy talking about the Lusaka agenda, and I want to hear your initial reactions. We've seen in the past efforts to increase coordination, to increase alignment with national priorities. Is this different? How is it different? So, Jose Manuel, if you want to get us started, over to you. Thank you, Javier. First of all, let me just say very briefly, thank you to the Center for Global Development for convening this discussion, very timely discussion, because it comes immediately after the launch of the FGHI co-chair statement uh, yesterday. Thank you. Thank you also to my fellow uh, panelists and thank you to all those who are participating in this exercise. I'd like also to congratulate the co-chairs, Norway and Kenya, and more concretely, Mercy and John Arn, who is not here with us, is, a, as you know, a member of the board of, of Gavi, uh, to congratulate them for driving this initiative and uh, being able to reach such a important participation across the board. I believe this initiative, and now answering directly your question, Javier, has gone further than previous ones because it was more, um, it was able to successful in leveraging global events and dialogues to catalyze um, and sustain stakeholder engagement in this process uh, over the course of past year or so. And this has been possible thanks to a very deeply collaborative approach that FGHI has taken. And uh, uh, here at Gavi, we have appreciated it very much myself since the beginning when John Arn um, asked me to support this exercise. I immediately told him that we, as, as chair of the board of Gavi, I very much support those goals. But also afterwards, 
the Secretariat of Gavi, in fact, accepted very much and appreciated the consultative process and the opportunity to be heard. So I think this is very important in terms of transparency and communication. And as you know, uh, the Secretariat of Gavi has been coordinating closely with the Global Fund, also the Global Financing Facility, to support the development of uh, this uh, approach, in fact, the approach that uh, was launched yesterday in the Lusaka agenda. Uh, we are committed to enhancing collaboration uh, with our partners to increase our synergies and impact, also to uh, achieve more, some, uh, let's say, more, more efficiency. And, uh, and as an alliance of key global partners, because, you know, Gavi is itself an alliance, so it's only natural that you understand that, because Gavi was founded by the WHO, uh, UNICEF, uh, World Bank, and also Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we are an alliance ourselves, but we, that's why we, it comes natural that we believe we should work with others. And this is what's happening. Of course, we are at the initial process. By the way, just now in Ghana, I see uh, Patrick, we just came from Ghana last week in, we are in Accra, very successful board meeting. Uh, we discussed this issue. So um, I myself mentioned it several times in the board or in the retreat, we also had a retreat. And so we are at the first steps of doing that. But for instance, now the Gavi Secretariat is taking outcomes from the FGHI process into consideration as it is preparing a proposal of strategy for the next period, the next strategic period, 2026-2030. So I think now it's important, building on the very good cooperation, collaborative approach taken so far, now concentrating on implementation and achieving what is realistic to achieve. So I believe we are on the right track. Thank you very much, Jose Manuel. We'll come back to some of those points later on. But let's hear from, from Patrick now. Patrick, same question to you. What are your initial impressions? What are your initial reactions about the LUSAC agenda? Welcome to CGT, Patrick. Thank you very much. I want to join with Jose Barroso in congratulating the team, especially uh, Messi, Jonan, and the wonderful secretary led by Linda, which has taken us this far. I think go we'll straight to the point. I think the, um, this is different. This is not the same as the others because others are either one or two intervention, but this tend to put a lot of the interventions together that addresses. First is addressing governance issues. It's addressing architecture of the global financial system, which is extremely uh, important. It also tries to bring, um, create a collective involvement of all, including countries, um, donors, and then the uh, GHI. So this is also quite different. Most importantly, some of the basics of any development in health that allow any country to uh, scale out of that uh, challenge of uh, improving care is the strength of the health systems and also focusing on primary health care. And then this uh, uh, new uh, alignment and this new statement from the Osaka Agreement take make sure that is bringing health system and um, primary health care to the fore. I remember how it took us a long time to be able to get health system to be part of the global fund. And I think this is a, a good way we learn many lessons together. And most importantly, also tries to bring the GHIs together, not necessarily uh, put them on one table, but also by establishing those systems, it brings them much more closer so that they can more have be able to support uh, the countries better and also be get better results. Right. So these are what I want to say. These are the key areas that I believe that because it's very comprehensive, it's going to be able to bring and bring or not just even the country, but also bring CSOs and the private sector together uh, in a way that allows uh, a more comprehensive approach to addressing health uh, concerns. Over. Thank you, Patrick. Jork, what, what are your thoughts on this um, initial question about reactions and first thoughts on the agenda? No, oh, thanks, uh, Javier. Let me also join the previous speakers in thanking Mercy and Yunan. And then to mention to Yunan is actually here with me in my office. So he's listening to, <laughs> to what you're saying, appreciating, I think, the, the um, uh, feedback. It's been very interesting for us as Norway to be involved in this, in the future of global health initiatives process, also having been involved in the establishment of many of the health initiatives that we are now 
you know, working together with to to see how we can really move the discussion. I think from an architect, help, global health architecture that was very much set up to help us achieve the Millennium Development Goals. And there's nothing wrong with that. Gavi has achieved great, great results. Global Fund has achieved great results. So has GFF and and the others. But as we move forward in the SDG uh, era and looking at how to achieve universal health coverage and supporting countries in achieving universal health coverage, supporting primary health care, we have a momentum now that I believe has come out quite clearly in the report of the Future of Global Health Initiatives. Um, and one one aspect of this that to me is uh, slightly, well, there are several aspects of this that give me faith that we will succeed this time. Uh, one of them is the very clear message from countries. So I've, I know there have been, you know, extensive consultation in coming up with the uh, conclusions in, and recommendations in the report launched yesterday. Uh, important consultations with, with countries, with civil societies, with, uh, of course, the global health initiatives themselves and the boards. That's been very, very uh, important. Uh, and I was able to participate in some of these consultations during the regional committee meeting in Gaborone in August and heard that very strong, strong call from countries that this is what they are, are looking for. And so that's uh, tells me that there is a momentum now to move forward in this direction um, and are very optimistic that we can deliver on the Lusaka agenda where we think you know mutual accountability is a key word and we are very committed to working now in the boards of the global health initiatives and also in you know supporting now the next step Hot on the heels of the launch of the recommendations yesterday, as uh, Mercy, you know, so very clearly outlined, moving forward now to make sure that we implement. Thank you. Thank you, Jorg. Uh, Nida, welcome to CGT. The floor is yours. What are your initial reactions? Thank you, Javier. Mm -hmm. I'd like to reflect uh, my fellow panelists' uh, words on on. Um, congratulating everybody involved in the FGHI process in, in getting to the, the point that we're at. And I appreciate the invitation to contribute to the discussion um, today as well. So in reflecting on, on the question that you asked, Javier, um, I think I'd like to, to bed my answer in, in talking through the, the challenges uh, around health financing and the global health landscape. And um, these challenges are well known. We've seen We've seen in issues around country ownership, around fragmentation, duplication, wastage. Um, and now after the multiple crises, such as the pandemic, various conflicts and the economic challenges, we've seen that the need for financing has increased, but the resources that are available are again stretched further. And we're also seeing that the disparities themselves are, have grown. If we look at the World Health Organization's 2023 Global Health Expenditure Reports, which um, came out earlier this week, Public spending on health actually increased in most countries, but yet it decreased in low-income countries. And here, um, services were actually bolstered by external aid. So these conversations, such as the FGA conversations, are really well needed at this point in time. And as Mercy mentioned, there have been other efforts on aid effectiveness that have made incremental steps on improving the global health architecture. However, these conversations were, were really needed to be brought back to, back into the fore at this point in time, and that's exactly what the FGHI process has done. So, so thank you to everybody for that. And I think one of the things that I'd also like to say uh, from the outset in the context of this discussion is that this isn't meant to be a simple transition from, from one way of working to another. A lot of global health institutions were supporting programmatic approaches because there were emergencies, pandemics and health crises that, that required that kind of response. So it's not about throwing the baby out with the bathwater and moving completely from a programmatic approach to a health system strengthening approach, but about pay, paying attention to what works and leveraging the system strengthening aspects of those disease, disease specific um, programs as entry points to then strengthen the overall system as per government priorities, of course, but to really use that to, to catalyze progress towards the, the five key shifts that Mercy had described. 
Thank you and over, Javier. Thank you, Nita. I, I, I think this is very interesting. We've heard this is different because it was a consultative process. Um, it was a process where countries clearly articulated what they wanted. It is a process that is ambitious, but it's actually happening at a very interesting juncture because of the fiscal crisis. Also, we heard from Jork about you know, realizing that the sustainable development goals are very different from the millennium development goals. And uh, we need to change this approach going forward, especially thinking about the future challenges. Um, but let's get deeper into some of these questions. So Jose Manuel, you know, we've heard from Mercy about um, how the Global Health Institutions Board boards will be essential here and we heard about joint work plan we heard about joint board oversight we heard about cross-board collaboration mechanism do you really think there's appetite within the boards of the global health institutions to implement these changes outlined in the lusac agenda uh, yes i mean when uh, i can respond from the gavi perspective i believe that's the case once again i want to congratulate the those who initiated this process, and now the very good presentation made by, by Mercy. We very much agree with the so-called key shifts that are outlined in the, the Lusaka agenda. We believe they accurately capture the direction of travel needed. Um, <clears throat> if you want to achieve progress uh, towards the SDGs. Um, as an alliance of key global health partners, Gavi is persuaded by the need for alignment across a wide range of public and private actors to deliver health in the service of countries. Concretely, for instance, now our CEO, uh, David Marlowe, participated in a, an event in Osaka on the sidelines of the International Conference on Public Health in Africa to share an update on the ways GAV is working to improve the way it operates together with uh, its GHI partners to increase the efficiency of external support to countries and also to align with the country's priorities. I think this is extremely important, this principle of aligning with the country's priorities. Uh, it's important that we support countries to be in the driving seat for their immunization programs. Now speaking about the specific mission of Gavi, immunization programs. Uh, after all, without uh, country ownership, you cannot ensure sustainable vaccine programs um, and that is uh, the ultimate purpose of Gavi support, to drive health sovereignty and resilient health programs, immunization being, of course, core part of it. Just to tell you something that uh, we are doing now at Gavi, and also uh, under the leadership of the board of Gavi, we have strengthened coordination and alignment with the Alliance through the Partners Engagement Framework, and with other organizations like Global Fund and Global Financing Facility, um, in a global health architecture that has become more complex, uh, it is also important to increase collaboration, concrete collaboration with organizations outside our alliance, which are focused on global health, namely Global Fund uh, and also uh, CEPI, Africa CDC. Africa CDC was invited as an observer to the board meeting that took just place now in, in Ghana. Uh, in the past three months, uh, in part prompted by this FGH, uh, EFGH I process, Gavi CEO and myself, we have met with leadership from the Global Fund, Global Financing Facility and FIND. We had, I have several meetings with my colleague, the chair of the board of, um, of Global Fund and also at the CEO level. And sometimes we were all together on, physically in New York or online. So we are trying to give it a real content. And uh, there is also, uh, of course, some experience and we can build on the good examples of collaboration that have already been driving impact. So, for instance, we coordinated close with Global Fund on issues related to data and supply chain management. In more than 40 countries, Gavi has supported countries to integrate immunization data in the digital health information system, an electronic platform that is shared by many other health programs and jointly supported by Global Fund USAID, NORAD, among others. So this is a concrete example of something that it's better if you do together than if you have, let's say, overlapping uh, initiatives. Um, uh, another example, uh, with the Global Fund, we have established now four working groups to advance our collaboration on malaria, health system strengthening, 
country engagement, and back office enabling functions. So these are four areas where we are committed to work concretely with the Global Fund. And we are also including the GFF in those work streams where we have shared interests. I already mentioned it. Another example is the work out with the African Union, the African CDC, to design an accelerator for vaccine manufacturing in Africa. Uh, and I'm so proud that we have been able to approve it by the Gavi board just last week after 18 months of close collaboration, including countries, civil society, donors, G7, G20, and industry. So it was uh, 1 billion, 1 billion US dollars for this AVMA that in fact is a kind of synergy that we try to deepen now with our friends of Africa, the CDC. So three principles that I believe are important for this to go forward. First, countries should be in the driving seat. And what we should do is based on their guidance, based on their needs. Secondly, we need to be focused on concrete improvements at country level, clear objectives in areas such as sustainability or health system strengthen. Third, we should, of course, also recognize that GHIs are only a piece of a very bigger puzzle. We need to look at the broader ecosystem, including the United Nations organizations and the World Bank, but also bilateral donors. Uh, all these are part of our effort if you want to drive change. So when the Gavi board met uh, last week, we integrated some of these questions into discussions. Um, and I believe uh, this is important for the next uh, five year strategic period. By the way, this strategic period, as you know, coincides with the 2030 agenda. So to reach as the uh, Norway ministers of Bjork uh, very much mentioned, the importance of keep focus on the SDGs. We are in fact behind schedule on the on the SDGs. One of the very few where we may reach is immunization. Uh, but we are behind schedule. And I think now we have to create this momentum. And our effort is not just a kind of about, about the process or structures, it's about the goal. The goal is to reach the SDG goals. Thank you, Jose Manuel. I really like your three principles and the examples you gave in terms of collaborations and working groups already taking place. We'll see how, you know, Gavi 6.0 um, takes on board all these recommendations. As you said at the beginning, it's a very nice, interesting wind of opportunity. But let's go deeper into one of the principles, I guess you talked about sustainability. And I want to ask Patrick about uh, public health spending uh, coming from domestic sources. We know that you know a lot of countries are going through fiscal challenges at the moment, and that will be the case in the near future. Um, how can this you know process and how can the global health initiatives support governments in prioritizing domestic health financing within the framework of implementing the Lusaka agenda? Over to you, Patrick. Yeah, thank you, Javier. I think um, if you look at the shift, one of them is also talking about playing a catalytical role even for domestic funders. And um, you know, the crisis that we are in the first times from the, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic and other global crises that have hit all of us. And of course, when you are weak, then it hits you harder and makes you weaker. So whatever system you're going to put in place, you need to be able to address current events and also system that will uh, provide shocks, uh, shock absorbers for such events as they may happen again. I think the key area is, um, for example, there's the area of co-funding as it's practiced now. It's also a catalytic event that allows people, countries to also look at the importance of also reinvest, uh, investing in their own health. And that is something that we think we should continue. But currently looking at the current economic situation of lower middle income countries, Maybe that one you have to have a second look at and see how do we um, make it more incentivized and make it less burdensome for countries because they really don't have the money to do the co-funding. I think that's an area that we may need to talk about. There's also the area of uh, advocacy, uh, which is uh, trying in supporting countries first to establish social health insurance systems, which will be a very good catalytic way of bringing up um, domestic funding for services across uh, the country. Also advocating for closer collaboration, uh, the GHI is also not just focusing on Ministry of Health, but also focusing on the legislature, the presidency, 
and the Minister of Finance in addition to the um, Ministry of Health because as part of an advocacy to ensure that we, we create the momentum to really take the necessary data sets that we need to look at that. But this can be done through major policy dialogues across uh, with, the, with the countries and through GHIs to see how do we get these key stakeholders to change ideas on how uh, such things uh, can be done. We we'll need to ensure that there's some technical support and capacity building in terms of ensuring that we have data for evidence through R and D and etc. These are all areas that they need to uh, that need to be looked at as we move forward. We also have to do a lot of capacity building, training, technical system, and also allowing to test the very system that we have developed in terms of our financial system, our audit systems our procurement system, how do we strengthen these ones uh, to work and make sure that it becomes, uh, we are able to not only increase the domestic fund, but we are more efficient in the use, whatever uh, is there. There's also the need for more partnership or facilitating partnership, not within or not only within the country, but also with foreign uh, agents and see how do we work together to improve the the system. Innovative financial systems are also very key area that we can include initiatives um, such, such as um, how can we get special bonds that will be used in advancing uh, healthcare or during crisis, how do we resolve to some of these uh, challenges that we can address. So these are more many, many areas that we can really uh, support, especially with social health and uh, insurance um, the GHIs can facilitate by probably putting in some seed funds that allows the countries to be able to uh, initiate and also... Uh, I'm talking about that because I can see how much it has helped us as a country uh, in terms of reducing out-of-pocket expenditure. And finally, I think there's a need for us and uh, with support from the GHIs, how do we redesign our health sector? I mean, the approaches, the system, to make it more efficient and more... Uh, effective in delivering the care, quality care. So I think these are all many, many areas that I believe uh, looking at the catalytic, the one of the ship that talks about catalytic support for uh, domestic, uh, there's a lot that we can do together to ensure that we are able to raise more resources internally and are also able to be more efficient uh, in spending and also ensuring that we also build capacity to strengthen the various systems that will ensure that we are efficient, we are less um, expensive, the care is less expensive, and we are able to address the challenges as we are. Thank you, Patrick. I um, just want to remind our audience to send your questions via Twitter at CGDev, hashtag CGD Talks, or email events at cgdev.org, or include comments in the YouTube window. And before we get to your questions, I just wanted to ask Jork something that uh, Patrick alluded to, but from the flip side of the conversation, Patrick said countries do not have the money, and we understand, you know, there's a fiscal crisis. On the flip side, you know, aid budgets are tighter these days, um, and we've seen this with the, you know, previous replenishment. Some, you know, um, funders are not supporting uh, GHIs as they were before. So, with that, do you anticipate um, issues in terms of? upcoming replenishments? How, how does the Lusaka agenda address these considerations um, of not maintaining funding at the previous levels? Over to you, Jork. Thanks, Javier. I think it's a, a very important question. Uh, the quantity of development assistance for health is important, and of course the domestic spending on national health is important. But to my mind, the the future of global health initiatives process is really not so much about the quantity, but about the quality of health financing. Um, and I've been re very uh, optimistic and very positive about the, the very honest discussions that have happened in the consultations leading up to the recommendations, where you know, what we are really looking to is what I think Patrick said, you know, how can we make receiving or their relationship with the global health initiatives and he used the words less burdensome for countries 
and if we can reduce transaction costs of country engagement with the global health initiatives, we will really uh, increase, I think, the quality of our funding of, and of our, um, our development assistance, as well as free up resources at the, at the country level. And uh, we've seen, you know, although all of us, at least in the donor community, have had goals of, of aid effectiveness and reducing channels and reducing transaction costs, what we've seen in the course of the 90s and, and after the turn of the millennium is an increase in funding channels. Um, the medium number of development assistance channels in sub-Saharan Africa per country was 12 in 1990. It increased to 28 in 2020. And this verticalization is not unique to health, but it is particularly prominent within health. And so when we see these trends of proliferation, fragmentation, verticalization, increasing circumvention of government systems, it does not support sustainability at the country level. So we you know, strongly believe in line with what we hear from countries and from civil society and, uh, and others that we, our funding is much more effective when it is better aligned around countries' own plans and priorities as well as budgets. So I don't think it's about doing more with less. It's really about doing more with what we have. Thank you. Well, this is an interesting way to, to, to say it. Um, so it's reassuring that we might not have less, that we might have the same. But regardless, I think it's important to really talk about the, the, the possibility to increase efficiency, reduce um, transaction costs, as you said. Uh, but that might take us um, so far. Um, I guess to some extent the Lusaka agenda from, from, from the outside is very ambitious in a lot of the goals. Um, and we might need to go deeper into well, deeper and beyond efficiency. Uh, Nira, you know, you come from the civil society um, universe and civil society has been extremely successful at getting support from GHIs, uh, but that was on the back of, you know, specific diseases, specific products, specific organizations. How is this model going to change to align with, you know, the Lusaka agenda, um, long-term goals and recommendations? Do you see changes in, in how civil societies will operate as part of this um, transition? Over to you, Anita. Thanks, Javier. I think the, the largest global health institutions have been supported by a strong civil society backing, as we've often seen during replenishment campaigns. And civil society organizations driving powerful campaigns based on tackling disease-specific issues or interventions. And I think these tactics have been very successful in achieving epidemic control or, or um, progressing outcomes for those left behind. However, we're, we're entering a very different phase in global health. And with that, we must establish change at each level, as well as each um, within each stakeholder environment. So from funders to global health institutions, and then also to civil society as, as well. And I think some of the words and phrases that have stood out to me from the FGHI process have been things like collaboration, coordination, and joined up. We need these approaches reflected in civil society as well. Historically, civil society has been participating in and has been drawn into, into advocating for these more specific um, and disease-specific issues. And I think that, that we could arguably say that that has led to have enhanced uh, siloing and, and fragmentation, but that has been a legacy of the global health environment at, at a particular point in time. And I think as a result of that, a lot of organizations are very good at operating in a specific way. So changing, shifting from that to a more systems thinking approach, I think that would require significant reorientation and readaptation by civil society. But positively, I think we've got we've got some really good opportunities coming up in the in the upcoming couple of years. We've got a couple of um, a few um, significant replenishments that are taking place, and that could provide us with the, or the opportunities to test new models of working and to accelerate progress towards the five key shifts that Mercy Mercy mentioned. And finally. I think although the FGHI process was time-bound, 
there are some clear opportunities that are evolving out of these efforts, such as the, the Friends of the Global Health Financing Alignment Working Group. And I think in these spaces, civil society can pay, play quite a big role to, to promote these principles of efficiency, sustainability, transparency, and to support the development of a longer term plan and, and roadmap, and to keep GHIs accountable to the commitments that they've agreed through this FGHI process. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, we've got a few questions here. Um, the first one is about um, multilateral development banks, concessional financing, and I think Mercy, you'd be great if you can talk about. You know, you you talked about the World Bank, but is there anything? The question is about what's the role of the concessional financing and multilateral development banks? Can you talk a bit about that? Mercy, over to you. Sure, sure. Thank you, Javier. And um, indeed, um, in, in, in the beginning of the FGHI process, um, the World Bank did come in as an observer and, and sat through and, and made very good contributions to this process. And I would like to highlight perhaps one of the key milestone um, uh, milestones that we reached as we were going through this process was um, a consensus building session at Wilton Park. And we did have the representation um, of the World Bank in that meeting. And one of the key elements that, that came through was to really focus this on domestic resource financing and, and really appreciate and understand that all our efforts are really supposed to be convening and converging around domestic resources for health um, with countries leading that process. Now, um, I think uh, Nida has said it perfectly that um, this, this work was time bound and, and has been able to deliver these five strategic shifts and the Lusaka agenda. And the phase that we see uh, starting on in January is really an implementation phase. And it is an implementation phase that will be um, very much like a squid or octopus. So there will be heavy leaning onto existing processes and, and building and really nesting this into existing processes. I would like to highlight some of the ones that have already come to our attention and that have shown problems and that we've actually started engaging with them. So I do agree there is the Global Health Financing Alignment Working Group. Um, there is um, different initiatives under um, GAP, um, particularly the PHC GAP Accelerator and the Health Financing Accelerator. We have a lot of opportunities and I've heard actually invitation by the community health delivery platform that was launched on the sidelines of the summit by USAID, UNICEF, WHO and the World Bank and other partners. And so really the idea is this conversation was to essentially initiate and catalyze this discussion with a clear realization that this goes beyond the GHIs, this goes beyond Global Fund, this close, goes beyond Gavi, goes beyond GFF, CEPIFI and UNITED. And I think uh, Jose said it, you know, we do need to think about the UN agencies, WHO, the World Bank, how do they all fit in into really creating a future that, um, catalyzes towards domestic resource financing. I hope I've answered the question, Javier. Yes, thank you. We've got a question from Chris Collins, um, Collins about um, whether the agenda includes the commitment to work to end the epidemics of HIV, AIDS, TB and malaria, and whether there is commitment to include civil society in decision making. Um, anyone wants to respond? Mercy, you're already saying well, yeah and, and, and I think, you want to go ahead yeah sorry Javier this shows you my excitement around this piece of work um and Nida said it perfectly um this initiative was really centered on looking at our health system as a whole as an ecosystem and uh by no means um was this a way of divert of you know diverting re resources or investments from programmatic work but rather um using um the current resource and investment basket to really uh deliver on core mandate, which is programmatic, but then also then catalyze this change in the health system. And I really, really welcome Nida's um, comments on really the future will require heavier, um, full-on engagement by civil society to, to start really echoing the principles of, of, of accountability, transparency, and um, integration when it comes to um, health system strengthening. If I may, since uh, uh, about civil society, I really want to say that we are so grateful for the, the their actions so decisive now regarding speaking specifically about GAPI. 
uh, we believe some of, uh, we will not have succeeded in some points of advocacy without the strong involvement of the civil society. And, and I really have admiration how they can integrate because, for instance, in Gavi, we have one representative in the board that represents, I think there are, I don't know, how many hundreds of, of civil society organizations. So there is an effort there of aggregation, uh, articulation. And, and I believe, since you are speaking about these synergies, this is also a point important beyond now the civil society participation in our initiatives, is also what we can do together in terms of advocacy. I think it was Patrick we mentioned before, this issue about advocacy. Now we are in a phase where, politically speaking, there was a lot of attention from the political world, namely because of COVID-19. So that public health came to the top priority in the uh, public uh, uh, let's say, attention. But uh, if I may also make some kind of self-criticism as a former politician, um, most pol politicians have a very high attention deficit disorder <laughs> because mm -hmm. there is such a pressure of the agenda, the political agenda, that it may go elsewhere. And of course, because are, there are many priorities from climate transition to refugees to the terrible wars we have in Europe and also in the Middle East and in Africa and many parts of the world, there is a risk, there is a real risk that public health comes down. So I think we have in the priorities and the attention. And, the, uh, and that's why here as well, we should work together, articulating what we can do together as advocacy with our uh, partners, namely the donor countries. I mean, we have great alliance we have among the donors. Uh, Norway is here, for example. But at the, at the same level, there are not all, because of pressures that we feel from a public uh, finance point of view, there is not always an availability of that support. So I think this is also an area where civil society organizations and our organizations, taken as a whole, can and should converge also on advocacy efforts. Thank you, Jose Manuel. We've got a question on financing, and I think this is for government representatives. So, Patrick and Amjurg, get ready. Um, this is for from Dr. Kai Hong Pua, and he said, you know, the, Singa the Singapore just released news that up to one third of its budget now comes from interest on foreign reserves. And the Prime Minister said that this unique system is Singapore's future financing. What are similar approaches like using interest on foreign reserves for financing um, or um, sovereign wealth funds on oil reserves and other forms of that that can actually be used in this transition or can be used to finance, um, you know, global health? Any? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I think in my submission, I mentioned innovative finance, and this is one key area that um, we can look at to show how we we get these things. But that's why, from what um, you say said, this is very clearly advocacy area because government have several priorities, several uh, gaps that have to be addressed, um, infrastructure, etc. Et so we need all this uh, advocacy and learnings from other countries to see how best we can do innovative approaches to uh, raise funding for that. I mean, syntax, etc. There, but governments are also very, very sensitive to taxing people because of elections. So this is, 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 a, is a very, very <laughs> difficult line to do. But I think we can look at innovative ways that also does not tend to also put pressure on the people, but rather we make sure that they see the value in the getting these innovative approaches to fund, raise more domestic resources for health. Burke, any additional comment on, on that? Sure, I think it's a, a very good question and how we can think creatively and innovatively around making sure that we have the, the funding available that's, that's necessary. But there is a, a parallel discussion happening now in uh, of different uh, international forums on how we can increase our global taxation systems and frameworks around taxation, plugging those gaps where money is drained from country budgets, where money should be available for, for health and education and, and, and welfare, and uh, not least, you know, what we are talking about 
here, but rather disappears through illicit financial flows or, or in, in other ways um, disappears from, from public budgets. So there are, uh, at least as governments and, and civil society, very strongly engaged and very important partners in that discussion in, in ensuring that we have those kinds of uh, frameworks in place and that we, we plug those gaps and make sure that financing is available for health and not for um, big bank accounts in other countries. <laughs> so just to add that to the discussion, thank you. Thank you, yeah. sir. May, may I just add something? I, I really believe there is not lack of money in the world. In fact, we never had so much money in the world in terms of monetary mass, uh, from sovereign wealth funds to institutional investors all over the world, uh, of course, big corporations. So the question is how to mobilize it, because we yeah. never had so much money. That's the point. And that's why innovative financing is a part of it. Another part of it is, of course, uh, namely for, for our institutions, is to enlarge the donor base. It should not only be the traditional donors, let's say, uh, the richer countries, but our countries that now are emerging economies that they can and they want to have a stronger voice globally and I think they deserve it, but they should also contribute more. Mm -hmm. I think it also is important, the, all this agenda of ESG, I sometimes say it should be ESGH, so uh, H being health, of course, you can say it's in social, but uh, specifically, so many of our corporations in, let's say, in the Europe and North America and other places, they they have some funds for this kind of of of, um, of goals, and uh, I think it will be good to to that they devote also part of it to the uh, imp uh, funds with uh, social and health impact. So I think there are creative ways if we make the case convincingly. That's why it's very important to make the case convincingly. So that the donors also see there is an opportunity and they see results. And part of it is also showing that when we can make uh, gain in efficiencies, we are doing that. And so that's also important because, uh, and now speaking of my former political experience, uh, for instance, in the European Union as a donor, very important donor, uh, also the donors are bound to, to present to their stakeholders some results. And so it's very dramatic when we say we are spending this, but we don't see the results or there is some waste. This is why it is important also to assume our responsibilities. Um, and part of the agenda should be how we can gain efficiencies in terms of efficiencies so that we can justify the money well spent for a very important cause. And of course, there is no more important cause than the life of people around the world, namely our children in most vulnerable countries. Thank you, um, just a moment. We're coming to an end, and I'm just gonna, you know, ask you to summarize and give me your 20 seconds conclusion, um, just to wrap up. And I will start with Mercy. So, one final thought uh, from each of you, and then we wrap up. Mercy, over to you. Um, I think for me, it's to really say that we all have responsibilities in all our different constituencies, and um, you know, much like uh, Jörg has said, I, I am hopeful and expectant that we will continue crafting um, a better future when it comes to GHIs, all towards domestic resources for health led by countries. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think um, we, we hope, and we know this, we are in a good uh, track now to really get some uh, cohesion on ensuring that we all have one goal, both donor and beneficiary countries and making sure that we as countries, receiving countries, are being more accountable to our people and to our donors, and also our donors making sure that they also are supporting a global cause, even though they are supporting a country, but it's a global cause because no country, nobody is safe unless all of us are safe. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Jork? Thank you, and thanks for a great discussion. I'm thinking what we are trying to achieve here is really to realize the right to health and through well, country ownership and in Patrick's words, making access and uh, relationships with global health initiatives less burdensome for countries. And I'm very hopeful that we will be able to, to do it this time. Great. And Nida? Thanks, Javier. Thanks all. I think 
These principles that we have been discussing are central to the global health architecture, provided that we get buy-in from all levels and stakeholders, develop new partnerships and use local approaches and actors, and then also like tightly align with the needs of each specific country's health system. So yeah, lots to look forward to and, and lots of opportunities ahead. Thank you all. Okay, Jose Manuel, you have the final word. Okay, what are you sorry, 20 seconds I, read, I read this book a lot, so I, I, we are not going to reinvent every time uh, the wheel. I think the five key shifts that were identified in the report are very good and well presented, very well presented by Mercy. So these are the five uh, key shifts. Let's now focus on implementation, implementation, implementation. That's the point. And, uh, and, uh, and I believe it's possible if we are committed to deliver on these five concrete key shifts that are so important for the evolution of the global health financing uh, system. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our audience. Um, we here at CGT will be following this space, implementation, getting things done, efficiency, making the case convincingly, countryside the driver's seat, a lot of things to follow up on. So thank you all very much and have a good day.